In this worked example, we're going to look at how you might set about studying the sort of data that we saw in the Suisse section. So let us imagine we have found an object somewhere out in space with the following strange properties. First of all, its spectrum. Now this spectrum has a bunch of emission lines and a sort of red lumpy continuum over here. So what can we deduce from this? Well, the emission lines indicate that there must be some optically thin gas, and this gas must be excited somehow at some high temperature or being zapped by radiation or something to make it emit. OK, so we've got gas there. This continuum down here looks like the spectrum of a red star. So it seems that we have a red star and somewhere near it a cloud of gas. So far, so good. What else can we learn? Well, let's say we monitor the brightness over one orbital period of this thing. So here's one orbital period, and here is the measured flux. And what we can see is it starts high, then drops, has a very low, long, gentle drop, and then comes up again. Now, that is immediately pretty surprising. It looks like a transit, so presumably this dip is when the star is going in front of the gas. Uh, because the gas we know is optically thin, so if the gas goes in front of the star, it's not going to cause any absorption. But the puzzle is that this dip occurs for over half the whole time of an orbit. So let's imagine we had a, a red star and a cloud of gas. As it goes around, let's say the Earth is over here, it'll only be causing some sort of transit right in this place over here. By the time it's here or here or here or here or here, it can't cause a transit. So how can you have a transit that lasts over half the orbital period? The only real way is if somehow the cloud of gas wraps around the star. We don't know the exact shape, but something that wraps around it so that for an enormous range of angles, some of it is blocked out. So that's looking pretty weird. What else can we learn? Well, if we take repeated spectra, we can look at the, the red shift or blue shift of the emission lines and the red shift or blue shift of the absorption lines in the star spectrum. And here's what we get. The absorption lines show no red shift or blue shift at all. They are just perfectly straight down the middle. But the emission lines show a big sine wave pattern. So what is that telling us? Well, it seems to be telling us that the absorption lines are coming from the star, and the star isn't moving. So the star is stationary, and it's the gas cloud that's moving round and round. Now, for that to be the case, the gas cloud must be much lighter than the star. If they were a comparable mass, they'd both be moving. If the gas cloud was much heavier, then it would be stationary, and the uh, star would be moving around it. So, so that's our second deduction, that the gas cloud is very lightweight compared to the star. The third bit of data consists of spectra zooming in on one of the lines, let's say this one, at different times during its orbit. So here is time A, and here's a spectrum, time B, time C, and time D. So A, B, C, D. Now what can we deduce from this? Well, at A, that's when the flux is a maximum, so that's presumably when the gas cloud is in front the star. And what's the spectrum? We see a broad range of velocities. Okay, so that's telling us that the gas cloud when it's in front is not all at the same speed. Some of it's at speed zero, but some's moving away from us and some's moving towards us. Interesting. Now, how about at time b? Now, that's when it's got its peak velocity away from us. So presumably that's telling us that's when the gas cloud is moving away from us at maximum speed if we're down here. And what we see is a range of velocities once again, but not, none of it's moving towards us, it's all moving away. The bulk of it's moving away quite fast, but there's some that's moving away quite slowly. And we see the reverse pattern at point D, which is presumably when the gas cloud has come back around to something like this. And at C, that's when the gas cloud's in the background, we don't see anything at zero velocity, but we see stuff both moving away 
and towards us. Hmm, so what's going on here? Well, I think this is all consistent with having some sort of wrap around cloud of gas. So if you've got a cloud of gas like I've drawn here, when it's in front, if it's all moving round in a circle, this bit here is not moving towards or away from us, that bit's moving away from us, that bit's moving towards us. So we will get a range of wavelengths. When it's over here at point B, it's probably wrapped all the way around, because you see at B the transit's already begun. This bit's not really moving towards or away from us, that bit's not really moving towards or away from us, but this bit's moving pretty fast away from us. So that explains the shape we see here. And similarly over here for when it's coming towards us. When it's right behind, the bit that's moving sideways and not moving towards or away from us is actually hidden by the star, which is why there's this gap in the middle here. This bit's moving away, that bit's moving towards us, so we get the away and the towards. So this all seems to fit. So we have a model here, based on the data, where we've got a red star and a wraparound cloud of gas. Now where it came from, I don't know. Maybe a planet or something was disrupted, or a star, or there was some flare, or something like that. And this cloud of gas is wrapped in some sort of horseshoe-like shape around and it's moving in circles with this period. And we know that the horseshoe-shaped cloud of gas is much less massive than the star because the star isn't wobbling to within our measurement error. Now there's one more thing we can deduce in this situation, which is how far the gas cloud is from the star. So if we have our red star and our gas cloud orbiting around it, some velocity v, which we know is 100 kilometers a second, some distance r. We had an equation in the reference notes relating r to the velocity, but that was derived, if you remember, for the situation where the star and the gas cloud had roughly equal masses. In this case, we know that the mass of the star is much more than the mass of the gas cloud, so we can't use that equation. We'll have to derive it using the same physical principles from scratch. How did we derive that equation? Well, we balance centrifugal force and gravity, as we have done so many times in this course. So we know that mass of the class cloud, v squared over r, equals g mass of the red star, mass of the gas cloud over r squared. So we can cancel that r, cancel the mass of the gas cloud. Rearranging, we end up with r equals g m red star over v squared. Now if we assume the red star is about the mass of the sun, that's going to be 6.67 10 to the minus 11 times 2 by 10 to the 30 over the velocity of 100 kilometers a second, so that's 100,000 meters per second squared, which comes out as about 1.3 by 10 to the 10 meters, so very close in. And that's what we can deduce given this particular weird set of data.